Thumb Warriors Unite! www.wallflowers, get on that digital dance floor. If you're too shy, Kajagoogoo, just turn that camera off and speak your mind into the ether facelessly and anonymously, or use one of those fancy filters on your face. Oprah's avatar is telling us to look under our virtual seats, kids. You get a show, you get a show, you get a show, I get a show! It's the new age of media, where everybody gets their own show that nobody watches. We've been breaking down the 1990s as the era where America's ethical integrity suffered its final fatal blow, launching us into the age of anti-social media. In this episode, I'm deconstructing America's societal decay that led us, <laughs> well, here, where we're simultaneously more connected than ever in human history while heading to becoming more divided than we've ever been. <laughs> well, since we were divided, of course. <clears throat> In the last episode, Commanding Data, I discussed how we've sold our digital souls, or had our digital souls stolen right out from under us, and then sold and sold and sold many times over, with everyone getting paid for it but us. We've surrendered our digital rights and our prosperity to wealthy third parties who have staked their respective claims to the social media landscape, squatting on our internet. Since America Online, we've slowly been migrating to a hybrid virtual reality, augmented reality, and reality, reality, reality. Well, who can tell the difference anymore? Well, strap your VR goggles on and let's head into the cyberverse to hang out with people in make-believe spaces that we could have hung out with in real spaces if we weren't too broke to actually travel to them. Of course, and if we weren't so, antisocial. And welcome to the podcast. The internet is older than we the people think. Its earliest beginnings are rooted in early 20th century tech developments of the telegraph, telephone, and television. But we really didn't have much of anything interwebs-wise for the average American until the very end of the 20th century. Most Americans probably don't even know the history of computers, if we're being honest. We just take for granted that it all just sort of fits into our phone or tablet or laptop. <laughs> oh, how far we've come. The Smithsonian has a scale model of the Univac 1, which stood for Universal Automatic Computer. One. It was the first. Weighing in at eight tons and using 5,000 vacuum tubes. America's first commercially available computer and first computer designed for business purposes was delivered to the United States Census Bureau in 1951, <laughs> over 72 years ago. <laughs> a grandma ago. <sighs> All of that bulk for a whopping 1,000 calculations per second. <laughs> that was faster than humankind had ever thought. For perspective, in the summer of 2022, a supercomputer achieved over a quintillion calculations per second. That's 18 zeros. A thousand has three zeros. That's 15 more zeros than a thousand. Hell, that's three times the zeros of a million. Twice as many zeros as a billion. In just 70 years. In a grandma's life. Initially, just for government use, by the late 1950s, those computers were used mainly by big data processing entities like Census, uh, Nielsen for the TV ratings, statistical analysis, government insurance agencies, those who could afford a 16,000 pound machine in a room dedicated to said 16,000 pound behemoth. In the 1960s, what we know of the beginnings of the modern internet was developed for American scientists so they could share data and information. Computers alone were these massive beasts of data processing power taking up so much space, loud, noisy, constantly running. Processing all that data would require a lot of uh, stuff, big stuff. The internet would be quite a way off for the general public. 
if you watch films from that era, the, the realistic films, not the ones who fancied themselves futuristic visionaries, you'll find an entire room filled with these huge towers of electronics, reel-to-reel -reel tape machines, blinking lights, big chunky buttons. A couple of films uh, stick out as examples in my mind, especially from when I was a child. That's where we see the origins of computing on the big screen. First for many might be Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. In that film, as the exposition of the Golden Tickets is unfolding, we start to see these various scenes from around the world showcasing the frenzy over the Wonka contest and the links some will go to in order to win. This is a film I will certainly overthink down the road as it's one of my all-time favorites for many reasons, like the little lessons taught. It's one great big Aesop's fable you know, when you break it down, and I will. In the computer scene I'm talking about, a rather annoyed computer scientist boasts about the capabilities of this fantastic machine. This greatest miracle of the machine age would tell the precise location of the remaining golden tickets. Uh, this huge machine that was an entire room in the background surrounding the scientist and the investors who apparently paid big money to find those tickets. There are all these racks of reels and buttons of a computer. It was all a computer. <laughs> Advanced for even that story. In four seconds, it spits out a card that reads, I won't tell. That would be cheating. The scientist begins arguing with the computer, offering it chocolate if it cooperates, just, of course, mashing random buttons. The computer then spits out another card saying, what does a computer need with chocolate? Artificial intelligence, like we talked about last episode. Another example is an old funny movie featuring one of my favorite comedy actors from one of my favorite TV shows. In 1971, Don Knotts starred as Hollis Figg in the comedy film How to Frame a Fig. Knotts' character was a hapless accountant in a small town where the big-wig city officials had bled that community dry with this massive embezzlement scheme. Well, to cover this whole scam up, they buy this fancy new computer called Leo and hand the data input tasks to our fumbling and bumbling friend Fig. The movie goes just about like any other Don Knotts film of that era. Most comedy films, if I'm going to be honest. Not to spoil it, it's a good family film if you can get kids to watch that stuff nowadays. <laughs> the film was directed by Alan Rafkin, who directed some of the biggest shows in television history. From The Andy Griffith Show, Sanford and Son, Bob Newhart, The Love Boat, Laverne and Shirley, <laughs> the list goes on. He directed films, some of them westerns, three of these Don Knotts films, and another one 1969's Angel in My Pocket, starring Andy Griffith. Well, I know what you're thinking. Useless trivia? Not really. Just perspective. Alan Rafkin, the director, did a couple of episodes of Bewitched and I Dream of Genie, but, um, oh, that's about as far as the science fiction and supernatural goes on his resume. In fact, the biggest bulk of his work in television was on shows like One Day at a Time, Coach, and it's Gary Shandling's show. It's just to say that as a director, Alan Rafkin was grounded in reality with storytelling. Now, why is that relevant? It's easy in the context of a film like Willy Wonka to see that computer scene today and think it's amplified caricature nostalgia. But when you go see the scenes with Don Knotts and Leo, the large capacity enumerative officiator, it's important to realize that Rafkin didn't go all Hollywood on his depiction of what a computer in 1971 looked like. This was 20 years after Univac 1. Well, hell, flash forward less than a decade to Dolly Parton, Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin in uh, 9 to 5. You can check that copy room scene with Dabney Coleman and Jane Fonda where she's falling apart because she can't get this massive room-filling copy machine to stop spitting out hundreds of sheets of paper. It's madcap zaniness, but not too far from reality back then. Three more years forward, and Matthew Broderick's War Games would be a hit and would go on to inspire countless 80s kids to get into computer science. Hopeful hackers. But even that movie featured huge computers to execute basic tasks. Within just three more years, all of that would fit into Johnny Five, the robot from Short Circuit. Now that was Hollywood. 
But the stuff before was pretty fairly accurate as far as computing machines went in the 60s, 70s, and 1980s. In the early 70s, there was a Kenbeck 1, one of the first home computers, which really was the equivalent of a Tamagotchi compared to your phone today. But in the late 1970s, the 8-bit Apple I was released. Again, these aren't widely available because not everybody could afford to just go buy the next big thing. <laughs> We're talking about the 1970s here. First off, while commercialism was pretty strong in our culture back then, it hadn't hit its full open throttle stride of the 80s yet. Those children's television and marketing restrictions hadn't been lifted, so the pester power for the new tech wasn't quite as high as it would be a decade later. Plus, it was the 1970s. Post-Vietnam War, economy crashing, gas crisis, unstable political atmosphere, bell-bottoms, disco, hippies. People were broke, man, popping out hundreds if not close to $1,000 for a new fad. <laughs> Computers were out, but it would be a while before they would become a thing. Sharing so much of the technology, gaming systems share a very similar history with home computers. In fact, having just data processing for a while and then processing that progress, then moving on to games, might have been an easier transition. But with Magnavox releasing the Odyssey in late 1972, just in time for Christmas, home computing and home gaming were on a parallel path, if not a crash course. Could your family really afford a Kenback and an Odyssey? And if you had to pick, <laughs> your kids picked the games over writing a paper. By the time Magnavox discontinued the Odyssey, it had sold 300,000 units. Perspective? Unlike in 1972 when the Odyssey really was it as far as gaming consoles, the best selling out of all the gaming consoles in 2022 was the Nintendo Switch, which according to several sources, by September of 2022, had shipped over 917.5 million units. As tech advanced, Commodore put out their VIC-20 and later Commodore 64, which really would be one of the first gaming systems for many Americans. From Oregon Trail to... Well, what other games could you play on the Commodore? Pong to Atari, the late 1970s to early 80s, saw the rise of home gaming just as much as computing. We sat on the precipice of the internet and making America smart. Then we put joysticks in our hands and never looked back. We'll get to the phallus fallacy of joysticking in another episode, I'm sure. The thing about Leo, the computer from How to Frame a Fig, is that like most publicly available computers of the 1970s, if you wanted to get the data from the computer, you either had to be in the computer room or you had to take the magnetic tape reels, very carefully package them, and ship them wherever they needed to go using the United States Postal Service, because that's pretty much all there was back then. There really wasn't an internet back then as we know it. Instead, it was basically glorified facts without the paper. With Cold War fears and, and Russia nipping at our heels in technological and scientific advancements, beating us to the punch with Sputnik, the United States Department of Defense began trying to figure out how to distribute data faster in the event of getting nuked. The internet was secret, even if some people, businesses, or corrupt city governments did have all these big computers to do the heavy lifting, the heavy data processing. Well, the average American surely didn't have access to computers, much less the internet. The federal government did, of course, and developed the ARPANET, or Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. But if you weren't involved with the specific research, you weren't online. That expanded as time went on to include more departments, divisions, and agencies. Then, in 1983, new technology allowed all these different computers and systems to talk to each other using a unified language, if you will. Transfer Control Protocol slash Internetwork Protocol was developed you may have heard it otherwise called TCP IP. Yeah, the internet wasn't invented. It, was, it wasn't even discovered. It was more like slowly developed out of a bunch of other technology. A Voltron of tech, where our powers combined. 1983, by the way, the year war games came out. <laughs> 
Would you like to play a game? Then, as the internet technology began becoming more consumer-friendly and affordable, and as computers went from taking up a whole room to just taking up a whole desk, Washington and big business began to see that there was financial prosperity on the horizon. That horizon would be addiction, more or less. There's a science to addiction that those in advertising, marketing, and media understand, and one that we, the people, don't always recognize. This science has its DNA in some early 20th century mass manipulation and mind control studies. You hear about Nazi and CIA brainwashing programs, Manchurian candidates, whatever. Some of it is dramatized for entertainment purposes only, of course, but there is a very real manipulation and influence going on with the various forms of media we consume. We either don't or won't acknowledge the dangers. A subtle and seemingly mundane example outside of advertising would be a news tease. Coming up after the break, this local woman found an unexpected visitor in her garage. It's the 80-20 rule. 80% of the information you need to be interested enough to stick around. Without that 20% you want to get what you need and move on with your life. See, they need you to stick around and watch those commercials. They don't care about you or your scheduler if your kid's waiting on dinner. They only care that you watch or listen longer. Those stories often aren't even the important ones, just the most teaseworthy, placed where they are strategically more than in your best interest. The media, especially your local media, has become big business. Consultants and owners, boardrooms in other states. The LA and New York news anchors wear this, and they do these stories first. Well, W blah 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 is top rated in the middle of nowhere Indiana, but they do this. And the consultants who make way more than the employees who work craft a cookie cutter delivery service of your information, prettied and packaged up, but it is all for entertainment purposes only. Lipstick on a pig, if you will. All to make you consume more of their time. Here, I hope you do. I would like you to consume all what? This, this is episode 35, right? So maybe 30 hours of content, if that. Some run long, some run short. My income, though, isn't driven by how much you listen. I didn't create overthinking everything to be my job. It just happened to become my job. Not just a job I started in order to earn a living. I have one of those. I'm not sure how big this would have to be for that to happen. So right now, I just have a message in me that needs to come out. And I kind of just do this episode by episode as I want. Because I can. But I need you to watch or listen to me longer. Not because of money. But because none of this really makes sense if you bail 16 minutes in. Mine is more for the audiobook audience, right? I know. Sometimes these can run long, and that's just not conducive to audience retention in the age of three-second attention spans. Don't be shocked. When I was programming country radio stations back in the late noughts, it was closer to 15 to 23 seconds. Then it dwindled down to eight seconds in the mid to late 20 teens. Today, if I can't capture you in three seconds or less, you're swiping one way or the other. In fact, I see how many of you made it this far. Only part of this is me. My writing, personality, style, delivery, the look, the sound, the quality, the hair, whatever. <laughs> All of that I try very hard to be what I intend this to be, but to me, this is far too important to attempt to dumb down. Well, I'm not saying this is brilliant. I'm saying overthinking everything. This is as entry level as I think all of this ridiculously obvious bullshit can get. It's overthinking, deconstructing. This isn't a paint by numbers process. Again, sometimes I use big words or speak in metaphor, storytelling, or alliterative patterns. I like to be witty, at least to myself, but all of this should be pretty easy to understand for a society with at least a high school education. We aren't there. The dumbing down and numbing down we've discussed. For all this history of computers, 
All we've really got is more of what we learned about in previous episodes. America got hit with a technology society wasn't ready for, and it was unleashed on us too much too soon for the sole purpose of making rich people richer. Very little regard was given for how prepared Americans were for this advancement. Maybe even now you're thinking, how would we even gauge if Americans were ready for progress? The thing to remember is we don't know because America has allowed the free market to dictate and dominate the narrative and flow of our evolution. In every aspect from our health and wellness to education, professional development, artistic or recreational pursuits. A child's path in America is driven more by their financial profile than anything else. A piano savant only knows they're a piano savant if they're allowed to sit at a piano. For so many savants, they never see that instrument up close in those early formative stages of development where passion and interest are bred. If they live in the right area, go to the right schools, meet the right people, and if their parents make enough money to afford piano lessons, then you have a piano savant in America. The path of least resistance has a gate and a code we are not allowed to have. As computers were shrinking, and the gateway to information and learning was opening right in front of us, again, America got handed our joysticks. Kids will choose fun and games over homework. America was online. For the first time, from the comfort of their own homes, Americans could connect with other people remotely. Well, let's back up. I mean, the telephone really was the beginning. Similar technology, of course, but moreover, there were conference calls, three-way calling, and many other innovations that brought people together in the years leading up to the internet like, well, never before. Americans have gotten more creative on how more to connect with more people more. Writing letters turned to chain mail. Simple phone calls turned to teleconferencing. Planning that big trip turned into teleporting right into your cross-country pal's access port. Wait, wait. We haven't done that yet, have we? Trust me, it's coming. <clears throat> Not without some complications, of course. Um... <clears throat> In the time since AOL was founded in 1985 to Yahoo a decade later, technology and our connective capabilities were expanding faster than we could prepare for. 1985's commercial technological advances were the Nintendo Entertainment System, the original, the Walkman, Casio calculator watches, and all we wanted to do was type 58008. VHS was just taken off, so if you really wanted to get fancy, you had one of those TVs with a VCR built in. Michael Jordan won Rookie of the Year in the NBA that year. The color purple came out. We Are the World, Rambo, Teen Wolf, The Goonies, Back to the Future. This is 1985. Ugh. In 1996, Yahoo's founded Hotmail offers free email to any and everybody shortly after. And by the late 1980s, there more and more people began using this new internet delivery service to message other people, to send articles, to send chain mail. Still, we're talking the late 80s to the 90s, and it takes a while for things to really catch on. But remember, this all happened within a decade. A decade where we weren't connected, and suddenly, we were connected. AOL was more than just an internet service provider. AOL was a community. There were chat rooms for just about any location and interest. You could meet new people from all over the world. You could privately chat with new friends, connecting in ways like never before. The anti-social media age began. MySpace was created in 2003. And since then, America's been able to park themselves on their own page, free of charge, easy as pie. Now, there were ways before MySpace, but MySpace was groundbreaking in how they did it and, of course, when they did it. MySpace. Do you even remember MySpace or MySpace people? We sort of pick our social media homes, don't we? 
And we know the Facebookers and the Instagrammers, the Twitter trolls and TikTokers, the YouTubers, etc. I got another set of episodes coming up, uh, continuing this theme on social media and its effects on we the people. They all have their own distinct personality profile, don't they? The social media platforms, if you really think about it. MySpace was different. You could customize it. You had a playlist of popular songs. It was your personality in a page. You could blog and connect with friends. Once it took off, you found that college dorm mate whose name you forgot thanks to a few keggers too many, but whammo, a mutual friend still has their brain cells intact and you're reconnected with your old chum. Former co-workers, teachers, elementary school pals, for kids like me who moved around a lot. <laughs> That was neat grabbing the yearbook of the old days and seeing who you could find. Most of the time you regretted it, but MySpace connected Americans like never before. MySpace was kind of the ideal social media though, wasn't it? It was Blogger, and Facebook, and Twitter, and Instagram, Spotify. It was really ahead of its time. In fact, if you look at MySpace and what came after, it's almost like Tom made this perfect dish that was just delightful. It hit all the flavor palettes, looked dazzling. Then some mandroid named Zuck 1.0 took that great dish, deconstructed it, and put it on some sort of a la carte buffet. So instead of having one really delicious dish, you had all the ingredients for the dish separately on your plate, and none of them cooked quite as well as the whole dish together. Well, we went from a customizable one-stop site for everything to having... All of that split up between dozens of sites, apps, and programs, and none of them seemed to get it as right. Oh, tech was evolving rapidly. So who even noticed? By the time our MySpace went away, we were so jazzed about our new MP3 players, we couldn't hear Tom's cries for help under our own custom playlists jamming in our ears. Oh, now we're going to need bigger computers and faster phones to handle all those apps too, right? Store all that music? And instead of MySpace having all your information, now dozens of companies had access to, well, whatever they wanted, right? You agreed to it, right? Every time you clicked the little checkbox so you could move on with the registration and get on to the fun, just like we discussed in commanding data. Who's there to protect our rights in this digital space? That's right. No one <laughs> at all, period. Facebook launched the following year, but like I said, things take time. By the mid-2000s, social media was becoming the thing those people did that these people mocked. You know, trends, trendsetters, and those old fogies stuck in the mud of tradition. For those of us on Facebook since then, we can scroll back in our memories and see old posts that don't make much sense. It's because the status updates used to be, <clears throat> Josh Brandon is... And then you would type, annoyed that George W. Bush is a war criminal and not being charged, according to the Geneva Convention. <laughs> in 2009, I was fired from the program director position at a country radio station in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee. The owner slash general manager told me months before that, that because of my support for Barack Obama, that it would cost me my job right after Inauguration Day. And true to his word, a couple of weeks after January 20th, he would can me. Now, the excuse he used then was a blog I wrote on MySpace. Now, I kept a tight circle back then because I was in an abusive narcissistic relationship at home and in work too. 99 friends had access to that blog, very few of them near the community where I worked. Still, this man who had offered to allow me to fillet him almost daily in the six years I was loyal to his company and helped that company grow, he took me off-site to his home, alone, just me and him, in his living room, alone, and fired me with no witnesses. I wasn't willing to fight that hard for my job, but I waited until this long to admit that this same boss made me keep secret his porn drive location. Now, why would someone have a hidden porn drive? Your guess is as good as mine, but hey, <laughs> MySpace blog. So in 2009, MySpace was still trudging along and we were migrating to Facebook. 
I know that story is more interesting than this, but it's coming up later in the season. Yeah, there's a lot more to talk about there. But to say that as the 20 knots drew to a close, many MySpacers were Facebookers. Fewer Facebookers were MySpacing. MySpace went away and then came back, but MySpace, what those who were there for it know of MySpace, went to rest with Friendster, AOL Instant Messenger, Vine, Yik Yak, and Craigslist Personals. The cream always rises, they say, right? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Twitch, YouTube, TikTok, Pinterest, these are the big ones today. I mean, then there's what Snapchat, WhatsApp, WeChat, Telegram, Reddit, Quora, Signal, Discord. <laughs> Look, the tech bubble, Silicon Valley, the whole origin of the internet. Man, it's a fascinating tale of corporate capitalism and unrepentant greed, the manipulation of the markets, the financial market, the job market. That deserves its whole separate series. This episode really isn't about the history of the internet or the history of social media even. No. Rather, this is about the history of us. We the people, again, were handed too much too soon with zero preparation in how to handle such advancements. Again, this is not an endorsement of conservatism. This is really quite the opposite. The issue is that we bowed to the conservative fuddy-duddies in this country for far too long, holding us all back from the real advancement societies across the globe who didn't adhere to insane make-believe fairy tales we're making. Instead, civil rights, women's rights, even minor <laughs> look, minority rights for every minority group you can imagine, marriage equality, health. We're still arguing about which lives matter in America. And we won't bat an eye when a black man gets gunned down in the back, but when an actual coup goes down against our government, we, <laughs> we, just, we just snicker and say, bless y'all's hearts. The dumbing down and numbing down of America. Is there a more draining and mind-numbing task today than scrolling the comments section of your local media? Ugh, radio and television stations in particular have an odious task Balancing the constitutional public misconception of free speech and maintaining the foundational principle upon which that media company's very existence is owed. Intro to Mass Communication 101. Two of the many things I took away from that. One, Felix the Cat was the first image to be broadcast on television. Sweet. It's my middle name. B, PyCon. If there's anything I adore in abundance a lot more than alliteration, it's an acronym. As we've discussed in previous episodes, the Federal Communications Commission, once upon a time, <laughs> was a government agency that stood for upholding community standards, uh, issuing licenses, upholding uh, licenses for broadcast entities, as well as holding parties accountable for things they may have done or not done. Uh, less so today, thanks to a lot of factors, namely for whom we vote, namely for the reasons I've covered in the last several episodes. When I got into broadcasting in the mid-90s, the FCC was no longer issuing individual broadcast licenses. I wanted one framed. But once upon a time, everybody cracking a microphone had to have a license. And that meant something. Then, not just anyone could get on radio or television or broadcast wherever and say whatever. Today, thanks to social media, marginalized groups have a voice like never before. And so does hate speech and bullying and misinformation and propaganda and ignorance and threats and, well, the cost of freedom, as it were. <laughs> as Jesus said in Deuteronomy, with great power comes great responsibility. So the FCC established that broadcast entities should first and foremost serve the communities to which they were licensed. What does that mean? The acronym PICON explains it all. A principle that dates back before broadcasting was even considered, before today's mass print, really all the way back to our colonial roots from 1727. PICON was embraced by the FCC as a standard for issuing the privilege and responsibility of broadcasting to communities and the people of America. 
back, you know, when that sort of thing mattered. <laughs> Broadcast entities should act in the public's interest, convenience, or necessity. PICON. The public's interest. The public's convenience. The public's necessity. Notice it says or and not and. I think it was and like 100 years ago or something. Something I realized up front, verbiage is deliberate, especially back then. Today, or applies. It doesn't have to hit all three, but it must at least address one or more. PICON. Think of it like the sign at your kid's school. Think before you speak. Is it true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, or kind? If not, why are you saying it? Now really stop and consider that for a moment. Use that filter in the comments section. PyCon. So the public's interest. That would be where you get principles of ownership regulation, uh, equal time for political opponents, emergency alert system, etc. News and weather and community events, programming for the community, working in the public's best interest. Convenience. Well, it needs to be in the community, readily accessible. In case of emergency, break glass, right? In dire times, we need to be able to get on a microphone and warn everyone the aliens have landed. The community should have reasonable access to their media, correct? Necessity. This is the most important because it lays out the very idea that broadcasting is necessary for our communities. Before the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and the massive shitstorm of corruption, collusion, and capitalism that ransacked the American working class in the late 1990s, many radio stations were individually owned. There were some corporations buying smaller stations, but the FCC had strict rules on how dominant one particular owner could be in a given market. Well, the reason being that if one person owned all the media, <laughs> that wasn't fair. It wouldn't be good for the community or the industry. That one entity could then dominate a public narrative, skewing the public's opinion on issues tweaked to the best interests of uh, whom exactly? Yeah, somebody figured that out somewhere between the 80s and 90s. <laughs> Money and politics changed all of that. You can blame both parties. They both sold us out. Just like I've covered from Reagan and Mark Fowler all the way to the infotainment age into the misinformation age today. A slow dumbing down and numbing down of American society. What happened specifically in radio? was the radio stations in the suburbs in the small rural outlying counties outside of major metropolitan markets got swallowed up whole by big radio. The offices and facilities in those outlying areas closed, moved to the closest major metro, where the big ad dollars were spent. Staffs cut, services slashed, and cookie cutter formats put in place. I ah, sure it sounded better than Wilbur from the Meet and Three reading the obituaries in the morning show than doing the good old swapping shop. But these communities lost their identity. They lost their connection, their tether to reality. They lost their voice. Flash forward to where we are today. Today, for example, in the city I live in, we have many radio stations, all owned by about five companies. Three major corporate players, two smaller companies, at least one of them is very local. Very local. We have three major TV affiliates with the Fox affiliate operated by one of the big three. In fact, currently, one of our news outlets has an open and obvious tie to white nationalist domestic terror cults, and everyone here just ignores it because the guy kind of looks like a dorky goofball. You may have something similar at your local media. We have a newspaper, but it's not 1990, so why are we even talking about that? Now, the, the newspaper social media, along with local radio and, more specifically, television stations. It's wide open with post after post, story after story, filled with endless toxicity in the comments section. We've all experienced it, or at least we've heard someone say it. In fact, the comments section is now sort of becoming its own cliché. It's part of pop culture. You've heard me talk in previous videos about how our society is dumbing down our intellect and numbing down our compassion. Well, welcome to the comments section. This is a place where anybody can be a thumb warrior with no accountability for their words or actions. A real person whose entire personal profile is just one click away. Or total strangers, if not troll bots from other countries. I should know. I've wallowed in the muck with the critters. 
It's so hard not to engage. For me, I'm an educated guy, and when I see somebody so blatantly wrong, it drives me nuts. Still, the comments on some of the posts can be vile, harassing, threatening, and telling of a direction our society is heading. My bigger argument here is that these broadcast entities are not only not servicing their communities by allowing comments on their content, but they're doing so solely for the financial gains of online engagement, virality, and ad dollars. In fact, by selling out the people's best interests and allowing just any yuck yuck to put their two cents on a news story, they're compromising the entire principle of PyCon, violating the public's interest, bastardizing the convenience, and eliminating the necessity of their existence. After all, who gets their news from local media anymore? <laughs> local media gets their news from somewhere else first, usually. Regardless, the comment section is very much a real thing that we all have to deal with. So it's something I've examined and analyzed for a long time. True confession and spoiler for you, almost everything I say and do is deliberate. I'm always trying to learn something. I've spent years on social media just exploring people's reactions. That's coming up in a few episodes. In the 1970s, Dave Mason had a song called We Just Disagree. It was later covered by a country artist, probably other people too. So we'll just leave it alone because we don't see eye to eye. There ain't no good guy. There ain't no bad guy. It's just you and me. We just disagree. It's a nice sentiment for keeping the peace in a different time. From the other perspective, we're where we're at today because of that mindset. At your work, school, family functions, not taking those hard stands against people with toxic ideals all along the way for years. We just disagree and agree to disagree and we move on. Pick your battles. But all silence does is enable the toxicity. The other side of that song is, I mean, yeah, maybe we aren't changing minds here. And look, I know for a fact I have. I've had people over the years come to me and tell me that I helped them not make a terrible decision. That something I posted made them think, or the fact that I said it and they respected me enough to listen. But, but at what cost? For decades, I've been a brazen horse's ass on social media, saying the most important things in the most unpalatable ways. Even if I've saved people from this cult, as much as I've put out there across all social media all these years, that batting average has to be low. Plus, what I'm saying may be right. It may be what needs to be said. And maybe I'm shouting into an echo chamber where the only people who get it already get it and the people who don't can't. But I know I've changed people's minds. I'm just saying that I understand that no matter how obvious what I'm saying is, what I'm saying isn't exactly kumbaya at church. The freedom is a slippery slope. How do we allow freedom without infringing upon someone else's? If it's one thing we've learned about a humanity, it's that we can't be trusted to do the right thing. Freedom of religion now means I have to accept being preached at on the street. And if I say anything about how that offends me, even if it offends me because I'm actually more spiritual than those pathological posers, I am then reviled as un-American for infringing on someone's right to practice and preach. Except, where is my right to exist in a world and feel safe not being surrounded by delusional, untreated mental cases? Now, that too might be considered problematic because the cost of freedom is freedom. Liberty in exchange for liberty, at least in America. My right to say it, your right to get your feelings hurt, or just ignore it. The right to bear arms, as misinterpreted as that may be, is essentially about this very dichotomy. How do you enjoy your right to bear arms granted to you by racist men who've been dead for 200 plus years with my right to enjoy a life, period? But much less enjoy a peaceful, nonviolent existence in a world where every unstable, uneducated temper tantrum stomping about cowboying like it's young guns in the wild, wild west. I'm your huckleberry. The freedom of speech is no different. 
In America, we enjoy this guarantee, granted by men who have been dead for over 200 years. Even if it means violating the sanctity of the thing we say we believe in that is older than 200 years, and still here with us today, to us today, like those glorified cavemen, they're not here, they're dead now, and they're only remembered because of books and statues. My right to live free of cults, guns, and ignorance is something that isn't a consideration of man. It's a much bigger ideal. Guns didn't always exist. Cults didn't always exist, though I'm sure it happened pretty quick. Ignorance is just a byproduct of capitalism. None of that matters to the universe, God, any of them, or any higher spiritual ideal, even if it isn't religious. Man puts a price on peace. Nature doesn't. Money doesn't exist in nature. We created it and called ourselves evolved. I might argue. In America, our rights are granted by men who said they were granted by God. Dead men who wrote these ideas by candlelight because electricity wasn't a thing. The phone. Mass-produced books. I, I just don't know how to put that in more perspective. When I consider that the ideals we abide by today are solely embraced as the same interpretation as caveman day. Cavemen! Fire was light, people. Light was fire. Don't you get that? We think because they knew things and thought things and had carriages and fashion and architecture and infrastructure that these people were evolved, but they weren't anywhere near it. To compare then to now is literally comparing the Renaissance to the Revolution, not the war, this revolution. There's simply no comparison between then and now. That's why time travel works as a plot. Think of Benjamin Franklin. Well, somehow he unlocks time travel back then. Then the whole thing is about him going back in time to what? More candlelight or less candlelight or then torches and waiting for lightning to strike a tree? Benji's brain would melt going too far forward. Well, I hope that confusion illustrated something for you because to compare the 1970s to the 80s to the 90s to anything after is each separately like those huge jumps comparing eras of advancement out of context of one another. Before, even the most advanced advancements, technologically speaking, were just small steps for man. Giant leaps for mankind, sure, but advancements churned along slowly as history has shown. Gradual growth. Then the aliens landed. Something happened. Future man came back and introduced himself as Nikola Tesla. I couldn't tell you. I, I would probably cease to exist even if I hinted that I would, so I am not going to tell you. But something happened. And when that something happened, it was a catalyst for science and technology. Almost like the printing press was for literature, writing, and knowledge, this was a catalyst that seemed to launch humanity forward exponentially. A great deal of that is centered around mankind's pursuits to harness, store, and reuse energy. But this catalyst coincided with mankind's communication capabilities as well. In fact, most of the last century is almost like this record skipping and bouncing the needle. Crashes of culture shock with no chance for we the people to rebound. No one there holding the reins. It's like a cultural crash course of bumper cars. Just as soon as you get turned around and find your bearings, somebody slams into you from behind. Strap in, y'all. Some of this is just how things rolled. But a lot of this was predetermined. A lot of this is sort of cultural programming. And why? To dumb us down and numb us down. So when it matters, we won't know no better and we won't care no ways. We'll just stare into our phones, make a video, post our thoughts, fiddling away as Rome burns to the ground. Yeah, don't bother. I already have the Nero app trademark. Nomophobia is the fear of being disconnected. Or the fear of former Major League Baseball pitcher Hideo Nomo. Nomo of that. Let's get serious. Nomophobia is the fear of being disconnected from, well, everything. Its roots are in the words, no mobile phone phobia. Witty, huh? 
I mean, if there's one thing we can do, it's come up with a catchy name for our darkest attachments. Our phones, devices, and what they connect us to from the moment we wake up to the moment we close our eyes. Maybe. Longer if you leave your phone on all night. It's a danger we've never fully explored or acknowledged. Since the dawn of the internet in the mid-20th century, who imagined that we would walk around with these devices we have today, capable of almost anything? That revelation would be Benjamin Franklin stepping into the Census Bureau's computer room in 1951. But that same culture shock could be experienced from someone just being introduced to the late 20th century. Those cultural, social, technological advances were rattling a lot of people's cages. Look, America was divided with the Civil War, but we don't often think about how divided and how long those tensions went unacknowledged before they did get acknowledged, and then how long that took for folks to realize we weren't united and split. Then the war. Then the reconciliation. How long that took. Then the whole economy basically crumbled in the first quarter of the 20th century. <laughs> A couple of times. And then more, bigger, war. America united, but only out of reluctant necessity. Remember that it will be on the test. Well, after that, more war. Then we got to settle in just a little until civil rights, when people finally said enough. 1964, the Dixiecrats, the following election, Nixon, Forder, Card, Reagan, Bushes, Clintons, Trumps, and oh, Biden. We've covered all that in the first part of this series. Now, apply what we know with this perspective, that America never united. We never were, and we only did so in times of necessity. Social media didn't divide us. It provided an amplifier for the wedge between society, maybe. It added fuel to an already raging fire, possibly. We were handed the keys to the Connection Kingdom. And we never even really mastered the all-men-created-equal part. Pun unintended, but apropos. Hell, we never really addressed the all-men part, but there's a hashtag for that. Again, unintended, but apropos. Social media's impact on society is something historians of the future will catalog as they document the downfall of man. For us living in the now, we've seen the highs and lows, the positives, the negatives. For every marginalized voice that's amplified, millions go unheard. For every issue that's brought to light, exponentially more unfiltered opinion, misinformation, and propaganda reign supreme. Clickbait over research. Pictures and opinions over academic articles. The so-called evolution of man has hunched us over to the point most can only reach for the low-hanging fruit. Anything higher is simply too much trouble. In the coming episodes, I'll be chronicling more of my deconstruction of social media's impact on this culture of cultism. How it's fostered the most alarming narcissistic traits in humanity, spreading an almost sociopathic virus through humanity's hive mind. One that affects and kills our compassion and empathy. One that diminishes our energy and desire to thrive. One that makes us complacent and ambivalent. When Republicans remove the restrictions on what children should be allowed to consume, we began the reprogramming of America's hive mind. We allowed each child in America to have a price on their heads. That's just with media consumption an even darker moral compromise with the price we placed on every child's head with our fervent phallic fascination with firearms. But just with the ads, consumerism, marketing, and crossing the lines between manipulation, morality, and make-believe, we allowed the grooming of a generation to be more... What, exactly? I can't answer all the questions here, folks. What do you think happens when you plant small children in front of a box of stimulation and deliver? Well, just break down for a moment what you watched, when you watched it, and really start deconstructing that TV guide of trauma. Believe me, I'll deconstruct some of our favorite movies and TV shows as we go along. There are things we consumed and got into our brains that we never really considered as toxic. But all those jokes that go over a kid's head and are meant for the parents to get? 
kids are still hearing them. They always have. Kids are still seeing people laughing at something they don't get. And what do kids do when they get curious? They ask questions. They try to find out. Now just imagine they've had phones since they were nine. It's these kids nowadays. It's like, if you had a kid who truly didn't get it, and that kid was always asking you, but why? Why did you find that funny? Why are you watching this? Why did you listen to that if you don't like that word? Why are you on social media if all it does is make you feel bad? Pleasure receptors in the brain can be manipulated too. It's how one shifts from substance abuse to faith. How one goes from pet to pet without much grieving. How someone bounces from job to job and love to love. It's those little lies we tell ourselves. Food addicts turn to exercise, not so much for the health benefits, but because smoking is worse for you. We often don't address the deeper issue. We just repurpose the trauma response to one that makes us feel less shitty. Since the age of the internet, our culture has gotten more distant despite becoming more connected. We're joined at the hip with technology like never before, yet so consumed with it we often miss the world around us. We're so obsessed with getting that panoramic picture of the sunset, we forget to just breathe and embrace the closing of a day and the coming of a new day. We're more concerned with the pose than the purpose. We've got to post our food before we can savor it. And then we suck it down in massive gulps, desperate for any kind of satisfaction. We miss the moments we're so obsessed with documenting. We have to tell everyone where we're at and what we're doing. Or we're more interested in where everyone else is at and what everyone else is doing. We're either living with purpose for everyone to see, or we're living vicariously through those who do. Barely talking to the person next to us. Hardly engaging with the world around us. Fooling ourselves that we're friends and family. That we're connected and keeping up. We've gone from keeping up with friends and family to keeping up with the Kardashians in a single generation. Our closest connections are strangers in our phones. Our hearts are emojis and our souls are sold to the highest bidder. Our comments and posts will be our epitaph. The rise of social media, in fact, has only served to usher in the age of anti-social media. Coming up, I'm continuing this discussion on social media and what it's doing to our society. What we've bred is two and a half generations who can't function without their phones. Well, specifically who can't function without Wi-Fi or some connection to the internet. So what does that kind of dependence do to our brains? Coming up in Terms and Conditions May Apply, I'm deconstructing America's addiction to connection, and we're going to crack open my old human development textbook for this one, folks, because by the book, we're brainwashing our kids, grooming them to amplify the worst features humanity has to offer. We aren't in the Matrix, kids. We are the Matrix. We're crafting a warped reality right in front of us almost inviting personality disorders and mental health challenges. That's just for the adults. Kids? Oh, nobody's had the children's best interests in mind here. Nobody. But maybe we'll find out why. Maybe we'll find out what we can do to unwind this cultural doomsday clock back to simpler times, as I'm deconstructing a culture of cultism. Thanks for joining me. Check out some of my other videos on YouTube. I've got all my original music, my uh, TikToks and other social media content, all of Overthinking Everything, clips of my acting and voiceover work. It's all organized in playlists for your convenience. You can check out my merch store. Get your Sir Talks A Lot, Swags A Lot. 
And follow me on all social media, like, share, and subscribe to this channel, and do all the things I need you to do. And if you like this series, please consider a donation to Cash App or subscribe to me on Patreon. This is my job. I'm Josh Brandon, and I'm overthinking everything. Thank <laughs> you.